I think one of the biggest challenges was, if I'm really honest, I think it's sort of facing my own prejudices and assumptions. Um, and, you know, that's quite a hard, hard thing to do at times because you have to hold the mirror up to sort of your experience, what you bring to the space, some of your challenges, some of your past experiences. And I think one transition in particular that stood out for me, which was why I really had to hold the lens up, was from working with sort of survivors of domestic abuse to then what I would term, I wouldn't term them now, but kind of what I heard and what was termed sort of perpetrators of domestic abuse, uh, particularly from moving from um, you know chari the charity space to the criminal justice space. It's a very big cultural shift. Um, you know, one of the questions was, you know, am I actually going to be able to do this? How am I going to feel about this? How am I going to be able to empathise with someone when I, I know kind of the actions that they've taken? And there's lots of judgment there. Uh, and, you know, I kind of recognise that. Hi, I'm Naomi Murphy, and this is the Locked Up Living podcast, where we talk with a wide range of people about harsh aspects of institutional life. We also explore some of the ways to overcome them and to grow and develop. I'm David Jones. So join us every Wednesday morning, six o'clock UK time, for a fresh podcast. So today you're going to hear from Dr. Rena Bajaj, who's a female British Asian chartered counselling psychologist with over 17 years of clinical experience within the field of mental health. She runs two practices in London and has previously worked in the NHS, led on government projects in schools and education and in grassroots charities and in the corporate sector. She provides therapy, couples and relationship therapy, business cons consultations, coaching and executive coaching. She's an expert in childhood and adult trauma, children and young people's mental health, anxiety, low mood, identity, alcohol and drug use, sexuality and relationships. And she's worked with many global companies providing consultation, workshops and training on areas including staff wellbeing, mental health awareness, diversity, mindfulness, mindset, motivation, habit building and stress management. She's worked with diverse communities including BM. BAME communities, those from disadvantaged backgrounds, musicians, athletes, high profile individuals and celebrities. I'm really pleased to have you on today, Rena. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, Rena. Very pleased to meet you. Now, you've had a fairly colourful career by psychologist standards. Could you talk us through it a bit? Sure, yeah, I think, yeah, I think I have. Um, so I started off in a grassroots organisation, so within the field of domestic abuse, uh, particularly working uh, with those from BAME communities and um, those were impacted by other people's substance misuse. Um, and then I moved into working with children, particularly children who'd experienced trauma and abuse. Um, and then I moved into working with young people within the NHS, and that was for a substance misuse service. Um, after that, I went into sort of the employment side. So I started working for a welfare to work organisation, uh, which is all about supporting people with their mental health to try and help them transition back into into employment. Um, then my career took a little bit of a turn. Um, I was what we call like a millionaire matchmaker for a little while. Um, so my role was to work with high profile individuals, millionaires, billionaires, uh, but mainly to do sort of the psychological profiling and then offer coaching and therapy. Um, and it's interesting because love can bring up lots of things for us um, where we're used to sort of achieving and perhaps being quite goal driven uh, when there's a sense of things not being in our control. It can feel quite interesting. And for me, that was a bit of a turning point as well, because as a psychologist, it was it was the first experience of working with quite a different client group, um, but there were similarities as well. Um, and then it took another turn, so I went into sort of forensic setting, so working within um, probation and a magistrate's court to support individuals with their mental well-being. Um, and then following that, there was various sort of service management roles and sort of training roles, um, working both within the school space and the corporate space. Um, and now I work uh, in my own private practice, um, so it's a mixture of therapy but also training um, and consultation so a little bit of a blend there. Fascinating so what do you think has led to you participating in such a broad variety of 
projects, do you think there's a theme that runs through it all? Yeah, I think for me, I think the theme is probably my motto. Um, and I think I've had this from quite early on in my, in my training, actually. Um, so one of my mottos is, I can't really expect my clients to push past their comfort zones if I'm not doing the same. Um, so for me, personal development is and will remain something which is hugely important, uh, both because of probably my personality, but also because of the work that I do. Um, I think maintaining curiosity is, is really important to be able to be present with people. Um, and I think the, the idea of change can really give us some insights into various aspects of who we are. So it helps me to remain curious about myself too. Um, so being able to work with individuals from um, a range of backgrounds has really helped with that curiosity. Um, and I think naturally, as a psychologist, we, we have the honour, if you like, of being able to um, have a snapshot of various people's lives, which I think does then influence your own perspective on your life. Um, and so I think, you know, continuously reflecting is also something that I think is super important to me. So. Essentially, um, I think what the gift that that has given me is it allowed me to push past some of my fears and to set up my private practice, which was always something which I was a little bit scared or fearful of. Um, so, yeah, the, the key theme is kind of pushing past your comfort zone, I think. Thank you. That's, that's uh, very interesting. And as you've mentioned, the contrast between some of the different groups that you've worked with is quite stark so you've worked with marginalized people in contact with the criminal justice system but also with celebrities and people who've been considered very successful mm. do you think there are more similarities between these groups than, than people might think i would say yes and um i think what i have come to realize is that everyone has their pain point um and that's that's probably really useful and important to hold on to uh, because it helps us to also challenge some of our own assumptions as well. Um, so I think some of the common themes across the board have been trauma, anxiety, self-doubt um, and even with super successful people on the surface I think uh, that can still be you know, a theme that runs quite deep, and particularly with successful individuals, and I'm kind of using the term successful in a traditional sense, whether we think about this in terms of achievement or monetary values or what society would say is a success. Um, for some successful individuals, I can kind of really see that distraction has almost been a way to to deal with or avoid dealing with certain traumas or, or self-image or vulnerabilities, um, but also sort of the more successful people get um, the harder it can be to then access support or to be vulnerable uh, because there are assumptions that you, you're rich so you should be happy or you're famous so you should be happy or you're doing the things that you love so you should be happy um, and sometimes this can really sort of get people to a point where they uh, dismiss their emotions or they feel that they have no right to feel a certain way um, and I think in some ways the same is true with marginalized individuals um, so I think the underlying similarity would be that vulnerability and that pain point and if that's unaddressed it can really uh, influence how people cope uh, with life and the way that they view themselves and experience themselves Thank you Has has, I was just going to say, I think highlighting um, something that often crops up in therapy, actually, that people can always find somebody who's had a tougher time than them to compare themselves against. So even when working in prisons, you see people thinking that, you know, I don't want to whinge or complain about the, the life I've had or the childhood I had mm. because I've heard, heard much worse stories from from peers and I think that must get harder the more outwardly successful somebody appears to be when they're achieving making great achievements in perhaps occupationally might find it hard to then um, focus on what's not gone right because they feel as though they're bleating on or complaining about something that they've every right to actually feel hurt or upset by yeah I was sort of 
echo that as well. I think a lot of that's tied into sort of our, our sense of self and our identity. And um, I think particularly with successful people, what I've noticed is that a lot of their success is tied into their sense of worth. Um, so, you know, I am worthy because I am successful. Um, and, and that can be really challenging because it makes it more challenging to be vulnerable. And it can also make it hard to take a break or to step away from that sense of identity or that one version of who you are. Um, and then I think you have the additional pressures like, like trust. You know, who can I trust? Why do people want to engage with me? Um, now that I've sort of achieved the goals that I wanted to do, how can I stop? How can I actually stop and be with myself? How do I know how to reflect? Um, so I suppose alongside, um, you know, marginalised groups, but also with sort of super successful groups, um, I think what we can find is the judgments and the expectations of other people can become really debilitating. Um, and therefore we might disconnect from the world or we might go inwards or we might hide how we're feeling. Um, and this can kind of create like more shoulds around what we should be doing or must be doing or who we have to be in this moment. So, you know, that's uh, it's quite a tricky balance to navigate at times. Thank you very much. As, you, as you're talking, I'm reminded of the uh, um, painful exposure by uh, Harry Windsor of his uh, emotional challenges and uh, difficulties. Whether he's successful or not, I suppose privilege might be a better term, really, because he just is in the position that he's in. But one can see how people struggle along this continuum of sympathy or lack of sympathy and how difficult it is for people to you know, thoroughly empathise with, with that. So when, when people are outwardly successful, it can be difficult for others to empathise with their pain. What challenges do you think your high profile clients face that other groups might not have to worry about so much? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point, and it's probably one of the main things, you know, who is deserving of empathy, uh, who is deserving to be heard, and even the term privilege, I suppose that's really relative as well. You know, what aspects are we thinking about privilege? I think there can be a lot of assumptions around sort of storytelling, which is why I personally, I love it when uh, I hear stories about successful people, but not just um, their success, uh, but the process and the pain uh, and the struggles that kind of um, emerge as a part of that process. Um, because I think we kind of think of success as linear and it's it's not like that, just like achievement isn't successful. So I think there's a different level of expectation and a different level of judgment that can come along with, with being successful. Um, and if it's relative, you know, are you successful in one context but not in another uh, you know do you then become super controlled and planned as a way to manage anxiety um, you know do you go to a, a coach rather than a psychologist there's lots of impacts on on decisions and things that are left unspoken and that can kind of create new traumas in the now as well I think that's such a good point about privilege and the relativeness of that and perfect timing David in terms of bringing up Harry who's obviously in the media so much at, at present and I'm not a royalist at all but I did watch two, two, two of the episodes on Netflix and seeing those mm. pictures of you know grieving children having to be photographed going through the grief process when their mum was killed you know it's hard to view that as a privilege isn't it so maybe in terms of um, money and status but actually that experience really feels a very very uncompassionate um, callous way to treat two children who were uh, who just lost their mum yeah I think we're seeing a lot of kind of the trauma playing out now as well in the media um, and and yeah I think uh, you know there's there's a divided uh, probably response to Harry right now as well some people might villainize him some people might see him as someone who is vulnerable and maybe people in the middle um, but even that to sort of deal especially when you're high profile to be able to deal with and process other people's opinions of you because that can really chip away at who you feel you are um, at your core 
And uh, identity, I think, is huge in, in terms of feeling safe and feeling comfortable with who you are. Thank you, uh, Rena. So you've touched upon this to some extent already, but what were the personal challenges you faced when making a transition from one client group to another? Yeah, I, I was, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges was, if I'm really honest, I think it's sort of facing my own prejudices and assumptions. Um, and, you know, that's quite a hard, hard thing to do at times because you have to hold the mirror up to sort of your experience, what you bring to the space, some of your challenges, some of your past experiences. And I think one transition in particular that stood out for me, which was why I really had to hold the lens up, was from working with sort of survivors of domestic abuse to then what I would term, I wouldn't term them now, but kind of what I heard and what was termed sort of perpetrators of domestic abuse, uh, particularly from moving from um, you know chari the charity space to the criminal justice space. It's a very big cultural shift. Um, you know, one of the questions was, you know, am I actually going to be able to do this? How am I going to feel about this? How am I going to be able to empathise with someone when I, I know kind of the actions that they've taken? And there's lots of judgment there. Uh, and, you know, I kind of recognise that. So I really had to sort of use reflection, uh, personal therapy, supervision, and, and peer support as, a, as well as a way to really kind of confront some of that. And the naming of is, is really challenging at times um, and kind of confronting your own sense of self is also quite challenging. Um, but I recognize that was a really important part of being able to empathize with someone and see them as a human. And, and for me, that was a big lesson in sort of distinguishing the person from behavior. Um, and actually, it, it helped me to connect with people because even if I didn't understand their behavior or their actions or their exact experience, I could connect with and understand emotion. Um, and actually, I think, you know, one of the big lessons I learned is that often, you know, behaviour is as a result of vulnerability. And there's, particularly within the criminal justice system, for me, my my takeaway was there's kind of lost uh, lots of missed opportunities as well. So the vulnerability then shifts into to other ways of coping. And, you know, I'm a firm believer that people cope in the best way that they know how to at that time. So there's always a possibility for change. So that was probably one big personal challenge um, and then I think secondly it's that sense of as you change roles you step out of your comfort zone so you know continuously confronting the sense of feeling de-skilled as a therapist you know am I good enough can I actually do this um, do I know how to deliver this approach do I know how to connect with people in this particular context um, how can I adapt therapy within the cultural context which is different in this environment so I also think that's quite natural to question and I think actually the questioning is good um, but you know sometimes you want to just feel safe and I think that's a natural human human instinct as well just to feel safe and know what you're doing because that makes you feel confident um, so I think uh, those are probably the two main lessons or takeaways for me. Thank you Rena. Thank you. And we've touched on already the fact that you've also gone on to develop your own successful private practice. I think one of the factors that puts people off private practice is uh, perhaps money trauma and the idea of pricing themselves and asking for a payment that reflects their experience and skills. How do you manage this without being tempted to devalue yourself? I think it's quite hard actually and I think it's very common issue for therapists so I personally have had to work through this and I think I, I work a lot with uh, counselling psychologists in training so it is also something that does come up as part of the process um, and I think there's there's a number of different reasons for that so uh, you know one could be around sort of the sense of value then we've got to consider ethics um, and then you know actually in terms of yeah our personal experiences of, of of money um, so there's lots that kind of comes into it so um, the way that I've really had to learn to process that and supervision sort of been a, a big part of that is to really think about payment isn't just for the 50 minutes uh, it's not kind of an exchange for your time um, so although it might feel like that and clients might view it that way 
you know, I suppose what it is, it's a reflection of our skills, our time, honing our craft, our experience, our investment in the process, both personally and professionally and financially and emotionally, um, CPD, personal therapy and so on. So it's the, the value is, is much broader than just time. So I personally have had to begin to view it in that way. But also I think underlying that, a part of the challenge has been to maybe just work through some of the blocks of not feeling good enough or worthy enough and just recognizing where that might have come from um so i'm quite transparent what i've done now is i have a pre-call with people and i'm quite transparent about pricing because i think for me if that's sort of named initially then you can kind of negotiate if you need to so there's a few things that i do i have a transparent conversation i do offer some discounted rates to students and the reason for that is because it aligns to my values of giving back um, I check in with people and review the process to make sure that I'm working ethically as well. And I also offer alternative options to clients. So, you know, they have a choice and they can make an informed decision around, um, you know, where they might like to access therapy. So if they can't afford therapy with me, for example, I will always offer alternative solutions and still try to be of support and help and use. Um, so I think there's the emotional element and there's also kind of the practical element, which is the non-negotiable. It's very interesting that, I, mean, I was just thinking that one of the things I think we do offer is that we keep people in mind. We offer people a space in our minds which actually goes on indefinitely and of course that's somewhat in contrast to what we may sometimes say to some of our colleagues about not taking the work home and that that kind of thing mm. but actually I never get away from it yeah and I think also there is an um, potentially kind of a, an influence in terms of how society views therapy for example so you know would we question paying a solicitor 300 pounds an hour no there's kind of a, a sense that that's worth the value but i think what we've seen sort of over the pandemic is the value of mental health and well-being so i generally sort of find that people are more open to engaging in therapy or, or they are starting to see the value and actually i'm probably seeing more people present uh, as a way of either self-development or kind of pre-crisis as a way to sort of understand their emotions and their actions. So I think kind of the way that therapy used and hopefully then the perception of therapy is is changing too. I think it doesn't help that there's also a confusion around different types of therapists and, uh, you know, I think different levels of training. Um, so, you know, I think one of the messages is probably like not all therapists have experienced the same level of training. So when you think about value and you think about psychologists in particular, that's a doctoral level training. Um, so I think there's, there's a difference there in sort of the value that we could potentially bring to individuals in that space. Thank you, Irina. So you've also worked with both children and adults, and did those two client groups differ in their impact on you? So, um, initially I'll probably say yes to that. So I say that when I worked with children, it was more earlier on in my career, um, but I did sort of notice the urge to probably step into more of a maternal and protective role. Um, so that's something that it did sort of elicit from me. And, and, you know, I was very open about processing that and, you know, supervision and working through it and holding the boundary. Um, but I also really enjoyed sort of honing my more creative skills as well. So um, for me, when I was deciding on my career options, either it was art or it was psychology at the time and I ended up going down the psychology route. So for me, that felt like a piece of me could also express themselves. Um, so I really sort of enjoyed that experience of, of more creative ways of being. However, what I would say is, particularly from sort of my days in criminal justice onwards, what I've noticed is that although we are often working with an adult in the space, uh, we're not just working with that adult, we can be working with a younger version of themselves. So I think that's where the, the kind of experience with children and the understanding and the thoughts around vulnerability and pain can be really useful. Um, so I don't think it's as clear cut as it initially seemed. Um, and I think, you know, it's a lot more intertwined than we might imagine.
Yeah, I think that's my experience too, that often it can feel as though you're working with people who are much younger than they actually are. And I think trauma often can leave people kind of stuck at a much earlier age of development, can't it, in some aspects of their life. But often I think in, in terms of emotional regulation or sensitivities within relationships. And you, you've, you're trained in EMDR, so eye movement desensitisation reprocessing therapy, for, for those who are not familiar. Uh, most people are probably mm. aware of the flickering eye movement component to this, but can you describe some other aspects of this therapy for any listeners who might not be terribly familiar with it? How does it work? Okay. So the way that I'll probably summarise this is um, a very simplistic way, um, but when we go through a traumatic experience, we go into survival at that point in time um, as a way to sort of manage the, the threat, whether that's a physical threat, an emotional threat, a perceived danger. And what happens in that moment is our primitive brain hijacks our logic. Um, so that's, you know, our logic is obviously responsible for, or our prefrontal lobes are responsible for things like uh, verbalising how we feel, focus, concentration, memory, so on and so forth. So in this way, our logical brain doesn't really have the chance to file the memory away. Um, and that's where we can get kind of stuck memories or flashbacks or we can get stuck emotionally, so when a feeling feels the same as something that's happened to us before, it can take us right back there. Um, and I think that EMDR can be a really useful way um, of kind of going into a memory or an experience in a very safe way. And what it does is it gives the logical brain a chance to come on at that moment, view it more objectively and sort of file it away safely. So it uses a process called bilateral stimulation. So that's just where you get both parts of the brain talking to each other and connecting. Um, and so rather than memories or experiences or feelings triggering that fight or flight or that reactive instinct, what happens over time with the EMDR reprocessing is that the level of intensity comes down, the level of distress comes down. So it doesn't minimise kind of what's happened, it doesn't make it okay. But what it does is it creates some objectivity where the logical brain can come on and see it a bit differently. Um, so traditionally what you'll see is sort of a rapid eye movement and you might see people kind of moving their fingers um, but there's other ways to sort of deliver EMDR as well so um, you can use tapping so either what's called butterfly tapping or tapping on the knees um, and so it can be really useful for um, you know working with specific memories or specific incident um, incidences that have happened uh, but even if you never get to the reprocessing bit, one thing that I found is just even some of the grounding techniques are, are really useful. So kind of the preparation for the EMDR is just as important as the delivery of the reprocessing bit. Um, so that's that's been my experience so far. Thank you. And what, what drew you to this approach and how have you applied it in your practice? Yes, yeah, so I'll be really honest. I think, you know, initially I was I was quite sceptical. Um, I didn't know if I what I thought of it or if I would like it. Um, so I was quite sceptical, but I had heard of the use of, of EMDR and kind of the growing evidence base. And I suppose I wanted an opportunity to sort of test it out for myself so I could make my own decision as to whether it's something that I use or not. And I think that's important, you know, a certain CPD where you're like, oh, probably wouldn't use that. And others where you're like, yes, yeah, this could be great to try out. Um, but I will say that I think it's an approach that I've actually grown to love, actually, and I use it probably more often than not in practice now. So I work in quite an integrative way. So, um, you know, and I work a lot with trauma. So EMDR is particularly useful from that. So uh, I mainly use it with individuals who've experienced um, varying levels of trauma. So it can be from uh, a car crash to sort of abuse um, to you know a specific incident that they're involved with um, so it's a great way to help them to work through that in a safe way um, and so I do integrate though other approaches so I make it more more holistic so I'm not purist um, but I don't think I'm a purist in my practice anyway um, so I might combine it with something like CBT or even psychodynamic therapy if we're thinking about past links um, but I think EMDR is a great part of the therapeutic toolkit and it has been of value to me.
You've also worked a lot a lot with corporations. Can you tell us something about your work with them? Are there particular psychological models that organisations have found helpful? So what I would say, I think probably over the last two to three years, um, I think that corporations are becoming increasingly aware of the importance of staff well-being, but I don't always think they know how to deliver that in an effective way. So, you know, we've seen an increase in things like um, staff feedback or well-being days, uh, but, you know, enforced well-being also isn't well-being. Um, so there's kind of a number of different ways that I work with corporations, but usually it's things like a specific training uh, and always try and include some CBT models in there so people have strategies that they can utilise and integrate into their day-to-day -day experience. But then also things like reflective practice uh, for senior leads, so encouraging that cultural shift and thinking about mental health because going into an organisation and delivering a training session or a lunchtime session, although it's great and people will take something away from that, it doesn't necessarily help to shift the organisational culture or thinking around mental health longer term. So I think the reflective practice can be really useful for that because it's then modelled within the organisation. Um, and then alongside that, sometimes I suppose I act a bit like an employee assistance programme where I might take on one-to-one -one clients as well. Uh, or offer some consultation around referral routes um, and then helping organisations to think about their overall well-being strategy so it's kept on the agenda so it's not a nice add-on but it's kind of an integrated part around thinking about people uh, because you know as we know people are an organization's biggest asset if you invest in in your staff then you're going to get much more back so it makes good business sense also to invest in your staff um so yeah i have found that there's still some confusion around how best to support their employees or you know how employees can support themselves so really i use a lot of psychoeducation using psychological models and then cbt tools just you know it can be things from managing emotions regulating your feelings thought challenging um, so in that way people have a takeaway. How easy is it do you think to um, change the culture so that organisations do manage to realise that, that well-being requires a shift in culture and it isn't about scheduling fun days or you know tokenistic tick box kind of items? Mm -hmm. I think it's still quite a challenge. So unless there's probably senior leads who have experienced mental health needs themselves, I think there can still sometimes be less empathy, which is why when I also deliver things like training, I kind of approach it as a two-pronged approach. So I will do something around kind of organisational culture, but also I will kind of work on an individual level so people have tools that can sustain them within a work environment. So I think cultural change does take investment and not all companies are, are there um, so if you can give people some tools just to kind of manage and regulate and it's interesting I think sometimes even with coaching people decide to leave organizations which isn't ideal but actually that's the best thing for them at that point in time so I think it just depends how forward thinking and empathic the organization is and how entrenched uh, some of the cultural dynamics are because I think there's a fear that can come with sort of change in the organisational culture because you've got to sit with the unknown uh, and actually that requires looking at kind of your vulnerabilities and what's working and what's not working so it really depends upon how invested people are in that process and particularly in senior leads and what they're modelling as well. Thank you and I, be I believe you're also writing a self-help book at present, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? I am. Yeah, so um, it's called The Magic in Me and it's um, hopefully going to be out around April time and it's a 30 day practical self empowerment book. So it's really the focus is on giving people the tools to transform both the relationship with themselves and their key relationships in their life. So it's a bit like having a psychologist in your pocket. So every day there's a certain activity which I encourage people to do. So there's a section based on 
your internal world, there's a section based on your external world. And the aim is to really then integrate both of those things so you can think about living a more authentic life. And, you know, I think sometimes the learning is the unlearning first, uh, and then we can kind of relearn things that work for us. So it does take into account things like attachment, past experiences, our thoughts, our feelings, our limiting beliefs. Um, because I think we're in a... in in today's world, I think we're kind of in a point where there's a pressure to live up to the expectations of others. And we can do that for a little while. But in the long term, when we start to kind of seek this external validation, it can feel, leave us feeling sort of detached from ourselves. Um, so it leaves us feeling detached from who we are. And this can really amplify feelings of failure as well. And we're constantly bombarded with information around who we should be, what we should be doing, how we should be living life that you know we can we can go chasing that so we've seen a rise I think in even the terms like imposter syndrome um, or self-esteem or self-worth so they're becoming a kind of natural part of our vocabulary but people don't really know how to deal with that so for me it's around the tools that you can kind of utilize to reconnect with yourself so you can challenge things like negative thinking patterns manage your anxiety look at your levels of self-worth and self-esteem and, and kind of feel more empowered in knowing who you are thank you Rena. finally a lot of your work has involved hearing quite painful stories. How do you keep yourself healthy and emotionally nourished while doing your work? Mm -hmm. I think it's sometimes easier than others. Other times, you know, I am sort of only human as well. I recognise that. Uh, but I think there's two key words for me. One is balance and one is boundaries. And I think I constantly try and check in with that just to be really mindful of it. So. One of, the, one of my kind of very strict boundaries is I don't work at weekends. And, and that's just a boundary that I've put in for myself so I do get some time for me. Um, and, you know, that's something that I've maintained um, quite well. I also try and schedule in regular breaks. And that's harder in private practice because it's easy just to see sort of the times go by and, uh, you know, you don't necessarily have kind of an annual leave sheet or anything like that. Um, so for me, every sort of three months, I try and consciously try and book something in or I might take kind of a long weekend or something like that. So those regular breaks for me and having fun and socialising and feeling more like myself outside of Rena the psychologist are very important. That's what sustains me. Um, you know, thinking about my support network and who feels safe for me is also important. Um, I've also got better at things like not always uh, responding or sending emails straight away or taking time to reflect or, you know, if I can't pick up my phone, just being okay with that. So working through some of the emotions that link in with that. And I think, you know, as a psychologist, things like personal therapy, supervision, um, you know, my peers, all of that has been crucial just to sort of normalise how I'm feeling. And my peers don't always have to be other psychologists, you know, I've got in the offices that I'm in I kind of build links and sometimes it's just taking five minutes to have a cup of tea or going for a quick walk you know those things are, are super important um, and I have like a morning and an evening routine that I've really solidified over the last couple of years so um, for me personally I start my morning with kind of gratitude and a bit of journaling um, and a bit of a meditation and I do the same at the end of the day so that for me is my anchoring at the beginning and the end of the day and so just on a kind of maybe a, a spiritual personal level that's something that sustains me um, and it makes me feel grounded as well um, and then actually interestingly enough I, I do sort of go boxing and I do some strength training um, and that's a way to kind of release that pent up emotion so I'm not good at things like yoga it's not that I'm not good at it I find it that it's too slow because I'm empathic and a lot of the work is reflective I actually like something a bit more high energy to kind of get the emotion out so those are those are the strategies at the moment but I guess I just keep checking in with myself to see what I need brilliant so more boxing than yoga yeah for me personally I know yoga works really great for other people but um I just check in with myself and yeah sometimes that release of pent-up emotion which is I find really useful thank you very much Rina that was a lovely conversation thank you thank you it's been great to speak to you